All right, guys, welcome back to Formula One News. There are realistically two teams fighting for P2 in this year's Constructors' Championship, one of which has just brought, we believe, their final major upgrade of the season. The other still has many more things in the pipeline. Is this a good idea for Mercedes to put more effort into this year's car than other teams around them seem to be doing? Will it help them in their development of the W15? Will it restrict the resources, the money, and the wind tunnel time they have for next year's Mercedes that they need to be back on top? Very much on Twitter, your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy subscribe if you're new as always here are four drivers that will not be on the grid as it sounds for 2024 they would all like a seat on the grid it's not going to happen though especially we think for Lawson just because we believe he's accepted a deal to sit on the sidelines for a year guaranteedly getting a seat come 2025 but Williams and Logan Sargent he's the only driver remaining and Sargent seems like he's going to stay. Vals and the team seem to want him around. And I don't really mind either way. I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, that they do keep Sargent. He did clarify here, Vals, that the gap on paper between himself and Albon isn't always as much as it seems. And he has made some progress despite the crashes that have, let's be honest, cost them a lot of money lately. But he did say, we want him to succeed. We want him in the car next year. Now, if they really wanted him in the car, they'd have probably signed an extension by now. But they still want to make sure, look, Logan, we're not going to keep you for sure yet. You better have some good results here and then we might sign a new deal. So I don't know whether this is good or bad. I will say that it might be good from an entertainment value because Sargent does seem to like to have a bit of a crash. So and look, Latifi, eat your heart out, I guess, what we've seen over the last couple of races from some questionable driving from, you know, Sargent, Stroll, and even Perez, in fairness, over the last few races has caused a fair few incidents. So a bit surprised if Williams go down this route. Can Sargent have a better second year? I think yes, he can. I think yes, he will. Is he as good of an option in the medium to longer term as even a Mick Schumacher, but also some of the other options we looked at. Dragovic would be interested in this seat for sure. Maybe not, but you know, he did a good job in F2, but really it was his qualifying in F2 that was his strength. We haven't even really seen that come to the fore with Alex Albon beating him every weekend all the time. And according to AMUS's sources, this picture was taken with Mick Schumacher, of course, you can see, going to visit James Vowles on Saturday in Suzuka, asking if he'd got a chance to get a cockpit next year. Apparently, though, he's not on the Williams list. Sargent looks like the number one option. And people are asking Toby, like, how do you know that's what this picture was? And Toby says, I've asked some people that know. And that's what he was going to talk about, which does make sense. But still, the belief is that he's not going there. And there are also rumours that Toto Wolff had given Vowles all of Schumacher's simulator data to try and prove that he's going to be a good fit. And Val said... Nah, we actually prefer to keep our guy or get an alternative. Even Christian Horn has been commenting on these subjects and says that Lawson has shown what he's capable of. We've seen what he's capable of, but um, apparently not enough to get a seat over some drivers that he might well have more promise than you could argue. Now, before we get to the upgrade stuff, there has been some drama about, as there always is, social media impressions, followers, stuff like this. Let's be honest, Formula One had a perfect storm over the last few years. The Drive to Survive series, the fact that it was running during the pandemic when nothing else was. Red Bull's momentum going into 2021, their great start to that season, the ridiculous title fight and campaign, and many of the new fans probably expected something similar come 2022. The reality is that's not the case. It's back to normality, really, in Formula 1, with, um, you know, this season maybe has been worse than some others, but, you know, one team dominates, one driver dominates. That's generally how this sport is, and a lot of newer fans have, well, reduced their interest in the sport as a result. I think it's only natural, but we do live in a slightly different era nowadays. The TikTok attention spans, Liberty Media coming into the sport and wanting to ensure that the numbers are going up and up year on year. That's why we get the sprint races, all this type of stuff. The reality is the numbers are down heavily from last year. If these numbers are true, this is crazy that the mentions for Formula One and the social reach it gets has gone down by like 70% between 2022 and 2023 with the inception of the Verstappen dominance. Let's say it was Leclerc and Ferrari dominating. Would we see a similar thing? Quite possibly, yes. But you know, there's also an element of 
Max, when he wins, like, I don't put this against Max at all, because he's obviously a phenomenal driver and driving at a level that nobody else on the grid can match right now, at least in terms of consistency, and is just doing an unbelievable job. But I don't think he exactly lets the world on fire with his personality like other drivers have. You know, thinking about Schumacher or Hamilton or even Vettel, you know, like, when they win, it was an event. They're really excited about it. Like, for Max, it's like, oh, simply lovely, like, another win type thing. And that's fine. Like, I don't hold it against Max. That's his personality. That's how he behaves. But I don't think it's quite as entertaining or as dramatic as we have seen in some recent periods, let's say. So maybe that's a contributing factor. But the main part is really that the season was great in 2021. Since then, hasn't been the same as you'd expect. New regulations, that's how it tends to go. More so the Red Bull dominance that I think many would have expected. But nonetheless, this is the general trend of Formula 1. The problem is that Liberty Media... They don't want this to be the case. They want to ensure that the sport is keeping on growing and they'll see numbers dropping by 70% in terms of F1's mentions between January and May year on year. And they'll think, you know, we've got to focus up. What are we doing? Like, how can we change this? And they might say to the FEA, hey, look, can we have a few regulation tweaks in there? Like, can we slow down Red Bull somehow? And I feel like if there is a situation where the ownership might be incentivized to try and do something like this, it might be it now, given, you know, the way that things are over the last couple of years. Now, we do have a fight, not for the championship, but for P2. It's actually really interesting right now between Mercedes and Ferrari. A roughly 60-point lead that Mercedes had in July has now elapsed to only 20. 20 points after the last couple of races. Ferrari are looking good. They're closing the gap right now. On average, their car seems to be faster than the Mercedes, certainly in qualifying. And we also believe that Ferrari are pretty much giving up now on this year's car. They have said that, yeah, they can't postpone the fight until 2024 with Mercedes. They intend to get second place. There's more prize money for doing so. There is less wind tunnel testing time for doing so, which is one of the other points, to be fair, which always causes a bit of question as to whether it's actually worth getting third and getting more testing time. But the teams really want to come as high as they possibly can. Ferrari, though, we believe they brought this new floor that did what it was expected to do in Suzuka. And that was the final major upgrade for the SF23. They might have a couple of further tweaks, but that's pretty much it for what Ferrari have got. The Model 676, what's been codenamed as next year's Ferrari, that's in the wind tunnel since early August and that's really been all they've been working on is next year's car. Mercedes you would think are doing the same thing. They say their car's going to be really a revolution next year. It's not going to be another development on the W14. They're going to start from scratch on the chassis and on the suspension and probably pursue a much closer to a Red Bull, even McLaren in some sense, style concept next year. So given the fact that they're changing their direction so much, I must say I'm quite surprised surprised to hear them say that they've still got plenty of upgrades in the pipeline. Last year, they bought a few things at the end of the season, such as Austin, but we thought, all right, they're probably going to stick with the zero pods. So it makes sense to bring more things to this year's car because then you can ensure, okay, this worked, this didn't work. That gives us more insight for next year's car. But when you're changing the concept considerably, which both Ferrari and Mercedes will do, does it carry the same benefit? So the race debrief that Mercedes did after Japan, where Rosie Waite explains that indeed they do have many upgrades in the pipeline and quite possibly far more than Ferrari do from now to the end of the year. Is it worth further upgrading the current car or do all resources go into next season's development? Ultimately, this decision is never as black and white as it seems. Whilst we will have to use the winter to make more fundamental developments to W15, there's plenty of things we can do with the current car, which will both make it faster and aid our learning and understanding to develop next year's car. And that's what we've already been doing and will continue to do. So the new parts we bring to the track do both. Hopefully add performance and make the current car go faster, but they're all specifically targeted around areas where we need to further our understanding and the things we'll learn from testing them this year will directly feed into the development of the W15. We also mustn't lose sight of the fact that we're in a really tight battle for P2 with Ferrari and that position in the championship is really important to all of us. And so we have upgrades in the pipeline and we'll continue to be bringing them to the car. So if these upgrades they bring work as intended, they probably will be in a position to secure P2 in the drivers or in the constructor standings by the end of the year. P2 in the drivers will be a stretch unless Perez has an absolute nightmare and Hamilton can catch up, I think, the 33 points that's between them. But Mercedes, well, right now you might say 
say Ferrari are the favourites to get P2 in the constructors. They look the stronger of the two cars. But if these upgrades work as plans, Mercedes might well be stronger at the end of the season and could well secure P2. Does that really matter in the grand scheme of things? Probably not. And you've just got to ensure that we live under a cost cap era now with a wind tunnel and CFD testing time era as well. You want to ensure that the things you're testing and paying money for are being as important as possible. Red Bull, let's be honest, probably stopped development on the RB19 several months ago now and have been working exclusively on next year's RB20. That's how it was with Mercedes back in the day as well. They would work on, you know, the W, what was it, the W10 or the W09 was being worked on something like a year and a half in advance of when it actually was uh, hitting the track just because that's the type of lead times they were working with when they had the best car on the grid pretty much every single year and Red Bull explore well they enjoy the same luxury let's say at the moment so Mercedes will surely only bring things that they believe will give them insight for next year's car as well so it might not be everything but we do think there's going to be a new floor in there and that was the rumor that came around a while ago that in Austin there's going to be a new floor for the Mercedes and I imagine that might be quite a big one because if they understand better the floor concept then it should help them understand next year's car the issue is that you've still got the same rear suspension on the W14 as they're going to have for the end of the year. I'm almost certain that next year's suspension on the W15 is going to be quite substantially different. So sure, you might bring a new floor that's closely, well, more closely aligned, shall we say, with next year's cars. But, you know, is that really going to give you the full information? Maybe not. So definitely intrigued to your thoughts on that. This was also an image that was going around of Russell's car after he'd been it, of course, in Singapore, getting lifted off and some images of um, the Mercedes floor as it stands. Now, we did see this in fairness back in, was it Hamilton had a bit of a contact with the barriers in Monaco and we got to see his floor there and I don't know how much there's really changed to be honest on the Mercedes since then. Probably what Mercedes don't want is for this to happen after Austin when they're apparently going to bring a new floor and then people actually might gain some insight if people were to see that on what they might be planning for next year. So it's definitely a trade-off. Mercedes believe it's going to be in their best interests to despite making fundamental changes to still bring some big changes to the W14. Did it work last year when they brought a few things to the W13 more so than other teams did? It got them the win in Brazil. You know, did it? Sure, the W13 became a race winning car. The W14 might not. Did it help the W14 be any better? Not really, let's be honest. So Ferrari and Mercedes seem to be taking different approaches on this. Red Bull will have for sure taken the approach of the RB20 has been the maximum focus for months at this point, And that may have been the case less recently for Mercedes and for the other teams. But if the upgrades do what they're expected to, then it probably will give them some degree of advantage. So very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments. Just one final thing to mention here that there is a rumor that, I mean, honestly, how many tracks? are we hearing rumours about? This would be cool though, right? The last time we had an Indian Grand Prix was in, I think, 2013. We had one from like 2011 to 2013. I think did Vettel win it every year or something like that. He definitely won a fair few of them. So um, potentially returning to India under the same circuit they raced on several years ago could potentially be on the cards. So that'd be interesting to see. I know there's been talk about South Africa, of course. There's always talk about this Madrid street circuit they want to do and move away from the Barcelona circuit, despite the fact that they fixed it this year by removing the final chicane so I mean yeah they're going to try and do their best and this as we talked about a few minutes ago right with the viewership side this is one of the things that Formula 1 will try and do they'll be like alright well if we're getting less viewership every race weekend let's just do more races right that'll be better for the sponsors so very much enjoy do your thoughts in the comments below hit the like button if you enjoyed subscribe if you're new take care and I'll see you next time